Next, we're joined by Trisha Prabhu, an inspiring teen from Illinois who, in addition to being a high school student, has presented at TEDx Teen and participated in the White House Science Fair. She's teaching other teens and all of us how to rethink cyberbullying. Please welcome Trisha. Go kill yourself. Why are you still alive? You are so ugly. Rebecca Sedwick, an 11-year-old girl from Florida, received those mean, hurtful, tormenting, and embarrassing messages on her social media. She had been cyberbullied for over a year and a half before she decided she couldn't take it anymore. She jumped off of her town's water tower to her death. In the fall of 2013, I came home from school to read that story. I was shocked, stunned, and I was heartbroken. How could a girl, one younger than myself, be pushed to take her own life? It seemed unacceptable. And that's when I decided, right then and there, that I needed to do something to stop this pain and the hurting that Rebecca had endured from ever happening again. But the damage was done. As a 15-year-old high school student, I know that each and every one of my peers are at risk of being a victim or a perpetrator of cyberbullying. That's why I'm determined to stop it at the source before the damage is done. Sadly, Rebecca's story is not the only story that's out there. Megan Muir died three weeks before her 14th birthday. Her mother found her when she came upstairs to get Megan for dinner. She had hung herself in her bedroom closet. This was after receiving messages on her social media like, the world would be a better place without you. The damage was done, and we lost Megan. Tyler Clementi, 18 years old, just getting used to his new life as a freshman at college and his new gay identity. But one day, one of his roommates and a friend thought it would be funny to live stream a video of Tyler and his boyfriend in one of their most intimate moments all over social media. And by the end of the day, Tyler had jumped off of the George Washington Bridge to his death. The damage was done. I so wish, more than anything else, that I could rewrite those stories. I wish I could make every perpetrator rethink what they did. I wish I could give each and every cyber bully a second moment to go, whoa. What are you about to do? Is this worthy of you? And I wondered, would Rebecca, Megan, and Tyler still be alive today if I could? Cyberbullying is a big issue. As I'm sure you've heard over the last two days, in the United States alone, over 52% of adolescents have been cyberbullied. That's 12 million teens. And if we take a step back and look at it from a global perspective, we're talking about 1.8 billion adolescents that are out there right now with growing access to the internet and social media. And with that access to social media comes the increased risk of being cyberbullied. What is cyberbullying? It's defined as an insidious and electronic verbal abuse, but it's online. And just like real life bullying, it can cause low self-esteem increased rates of dropping out of school, substance abuse, increased suicidal tendencies. In fact, new research from the United Kingdom shows that the scars of cyberbullying last well into a victim's 50s and 60s. Once the damage is done, it's very hard to erase. And so as I did this research, and I learned more and more about just how awful cyberbullying was, I started to wonder why. Right? Why is it 
that adolescents are so willing to post these offensive messages on social media. What is driving this behavior? I also wondered if adults were participating. So I ended up conducting a school study, and I found that yes, adults are a part of this problem. But adolescents are almost 40% more willing to post an offensive message on social media. And that, to me, was especially fascinating. Why that big gap? Why only adolescents? Now, I have always been fascinated by the human brain, even from a young age. And I was especially curious to see how the adolescent brain ties into adolescent behavior when it comes to making decisions. And so one day, I was doing my research, and I came across this very interesting article. And it compared the adolescent brain to a car with no brakes. Think about that. No pausing, no thinking, just acting. Believe it or not, that's why adolescents are usually characterized as the ones that make impulsive, rash decisions. So yes, adults, rejoice, I will admit it. Scientifically speaking, you guys can make better decisions than we can. And it all goes back to brain science, the way our brain develops. Because our brain, when we're born, develops from the back to the front, which means that skills that are located in the back, like vision, will develop first, and some of the last skills to develop will be the ones located in the last 10% of the brain, right up here in the front. This area is called the prefrontal cortex. And what does the prefrontal cortex control? Decision-making and impulse skills. By the age 13, almost 90% of our brain is done. But 10% is still left, and that's that prefrontal cortex. It will take us another 13 years for that part of the brain to be fully developed. What does that mean? When we're making decisions, we're not thinking about the consequences of a decision. We're thinking, what are our options? What do we want to do? And we make our choice. So whether it's downing 15 Red Bulls, skipping an English final, partying all weekend, and then failing tests the next week, the odds were we weren't thinking about what was going to happen when we made the decision. We make decisions in the heat of the moment. That's just how the adolescent brain is wired. And so I was venting about this to a friend, and I was talking to her about all of this, the adolescent brain, cyberbullying, a huge problem. And she stopped, and she kind of gave me a look. She was like, come on, Trisha. And I was like, what? She's like, you're talking about this as if you just discovered cyberbullying. It's been around for a little while, and there are already solutions out there. It's not that big of a deal. And I figured she had a point. It's true, there are other solutions out there to stop cyberbullying today. But I was interested. What were they? I like to categorize these solutions under a little category that I like to call stop, block, and tell. Right? So stop what you're doing, block the cyberbully, and then tell a parent or guardian. Sounds like a pretty reasonable solution to me. And a lot of social media sites try to advocate this solution because what it does is it eliminates the cyberbully and you're able to notify a parent or guardian and usually get law enforcement involved, which is incredibly important. The problem is it's not very effective. Over 90% of adolescents don't tell anyone that they're being cyberbullied. And that number only jumps, especially when they're being cyberbullied about something that is either A, humiliating, or B, something they don't want mom or dad to know about. That being said, it also seems very backward to me that we're putting the burden to stop the cyberbullying on the victim instead of on the perpetrator, instead of attacking the problem at the source with the cyberbully. And so I found it hard to believe with all the technology available today, that there wasn't a better way to stop the cyberbullying. There wasn't a better method out there. That's when I began wondering, what if I took what I knew about the adolescent brain, took what I knew about behavior, and tied that into a solution to stop cyberbullying? What if I gave adolescents, right as they hit post, to post the most mean, offensive message on social media, something like, go kill yourself, what if I went, stop? 
What if I made them pause? And I went, whoa, hold on. You're about to post something incredibly offensive on social media. Are you sure you want to do this? Would they change their mind? I had absolutely no idea, but I wanted to find out. So I started experimenting. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is when I came up with the greatest idea ever, okay? I was going to build a social media site. It was gonna become popular in a few days. We would have all the other popular social media sites out of business within a few months. And it was gonna be great. I was sure of it. In fact, I had already crowned myself a budding Albert Einstein until I rethought my idea. Fact was, it wasn't practical. I wasn't gonna be able to scientifically prove that rethink actually worked. And I wasn't gonna be able to really control anything in the experiment. So I went back to the drawing board. And I ended up creating two software programs, Baseline and Rethink. Baseline displayed a series of offensive messages to adolescents ages 12 to 18 and said, would you post these on social media? They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what the survey was for. They just took the survey. We recorded their responses and we moved on. Then another set of adolescents, same age, received the same messages on a separate software program called Rethink. The difference was if those adolescents said, sure, I'll post this on social media. You are so ugly, absolutely. We went, whoa, stop, hold on. You're about to post something incredibly offensive on social media. So a pop-up alert would appear on their computer and we gave them a second chance to rethink their decision. What I wanted to see was how does that affect adolescents decision making? Does it have any impact at all? Or do they really not care? So I ended up conducting this experiment over the course of a few months at my library, recruiting adolescents from the area that I didn't know to participate in my experiment. In the end, I ended up getting 1,500 trials worth of data. And the results were absolutely stunning. Over 93% of the time, when an adolescent received a rethink alert, they changed their mind and decided not to post an offensive message on social media. Think about that, 93% of the time. The overall willingness to post an offensive message actually dropped from 71% to 4%. My research proved that rethink before you type, rethink before you post, rethink before the damage is done is the most effective way to stop cyberbullying at the source before the damage is done. Since then, I've been absolutely honored to receive an incredible amount of recognition from my work. Um, I was named a Google Science Fair Global Finalist in 2014. Google acclaimed me for the science research behind this um, solution to cyberbullying. Um, I've also been able to travel internationally and speak at many platforms, including three TEDx platforms. I was recently here in Washington to present um, at the White House Science Fair. And I've honestly been very blessed in my life. But nothing matters more to me than getting Rethink in the hands of every teen out there around the globe. That's why it was an absolutely unforgettable moment when Rethink was released for free on the Google Play and the App Store, available to millions of teens around the globe for download. The response from teachers, parents, guidance counselors, and law enforcement has been overwhelmingly positive, and I have just been humbled. It's so exciting to think that Rethink's already going to be released very soon in multiple languages, and has been downloaded on thousands of devices around the globe. But Rethink is much more than just an app. It's a movement, it's a mindset, it's a call to action. We have several schools around the globe that have adopted Rethink as their campaign to stop cyberbullying. And my goal is to have every school around the globe adopt Rethink as their campaign to stop cyberbullying and download the software onto their computers and their students' mobile devices. We want to make sure that every teen has the opportunity to rethink their decisions. Parents, educators, school administrators, if you're out there right now, we have our Rethink Ambassador on RethinkWords.com. The form is out there. We give two students from every school the opportunity to become leaders and champions of the Rethink cause. They can help 
spread, rethink message, influence positivity with their peers. It's a really great opportunity to get kids thinking about what it means to rethink their decisions. It's incredible what one decision not to post an offensive message on social media can mean, right? Not posting an offensive message about the fat girl that sits in front of you in class can mean that girl's life. Not posting an offensive message about your annoying boss can mean your job. But when all is said and done, the fact is that the Internet of Things has changed communication. There's no denying it. There's an incredible amount of power that has been handed to each and every one of us as digital citizens today online. We cannot take that power away because there's an incredible amount of good that we get out of it. That being said, with that power comes a lot of responsibility. And that's why it's very important that we recognize that we need to rethink and make positive decisions when we're online. We each have a responsibility. Everything that we post has to be worthy of who we are. Recently, I received a message from a young girl, not much younger than myself, and she told me a story about her friend who the day before had been hospitalized for cutting herself after being cyberbullied for several months. And she said, I don't feel like I have any hope because it doesn't seem like anyone really cares about this issue. But when I read about you, I felt like there is a teenager out there that gets that this is a big problem and wants to do something about it. I receive messages like that every single day from parents who are struggling to get their kids back on the feet after being victim of cyberbullying for months, years. I've received messages from law enforcement who are working with these sorts of issues trying to curb the cyberbullying. The one undeniable fact is that the problem is real, the issue is real, the loss of life is real. So let's all please rethink before the damage is done. Thank you.